Good afternoon. The class is in session. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming and joining us for this event today. And please, uh, if you haven't yet, grab some drink and some food and, uh, and we can get going. Uh, I know it's a Friday afternoon. Uh, and so we are going to make it uh, very interactive. And what we have set up today is, uh, so I'm Nitesh Chavla. I'm a professor in computer science and engineering and director of iSensa. So I'll give you a little brief introduction about what iSensa is, what we do in our research program in terms of network and data science and give you a much broader overview of our vision, mission, and purpose of taking big data to the healthcare. What exactly we do, how we are translating that research, and along with me, my colleague from anthropology, uh, Randy Smetoka, is gonna share some of her experiences in uh, working with hospitals in Mexico. And then we had we have the rock stars who actually do all the work. All our students and staff who just show up here and talk, but uh, uh, undergraduates, graduates, and postdocs and, and staff from staff from my center. And what our goal is that we it's very difficult to restrain a professor from talking. Uh, so I am gonna make sure I stop talking in 15 or 20 minutes, uh, and uh, so then we pass on. Uh, and I hope that you walk around to the different stations that we have here and interact and see our projects. What we are actually doing, play with the tablets and how we have deployed, uh, see some of the initiatives, and more importantly, interact with the students. So they learn from you and you learn from them what they are doing and what they are passionate about and driven about from our research. So iSensa is uh, even, uh, in existence for the last six years now, seven years of, about, uh, and we've focused on uh, network and data science algorithms, pro problems, and we study big data, we study social networks, we study cell phone communication networks, we study biological networks, we study brain networks. I don't do all that, but we do that. Uh, and the, the collective we is very multidisciplinary. We have faculty from different departments on campus, from physics, biology, anthropology, sociology, uh, uh, business, enge uh, civil engineering, computer science, electrical, so every department and major department is represented uh, in the center and the institute. And the students, and we'd love for you to come visit us as well sometimes, and the, and the wonderful aspect of that is the students sort of co-situate, where we have no departmental boundaries where the students are sitting. So sociologists may be sitting with computer scientists, may be sitting with physicists and biologists, and because science doesn't ask for what discipline you are in. Science, the big problems, what we in Notre Dame like to work on, say, solve these problems that a society is facing, it doesn't matter what discipline it sits in. So that's what excites us as a center, as how we sort of bring uh, all these disciplines together. And we like to do fundamental research in algorithms, models, simulations. And then we have an application layer. We are funded by a, a variety of federal agencies, industry partners, foundations, uh, and truly trying to see what we can do for the common good. So a lot of my research is driven by how do we take big data, and when we talk about big data, a lot of buzzword around it is, let's do it for marketing, let's do it for consumers, let's do it, but how do we take all the data that's available and make a difference to the society that we live in? So some of our research on the common good, and a quote from our strategic plan from the University of Notre Dame as well is to, if you truly want to understand the, the mind, the heart, the human condition, and the universe surrounding us, how do we, and that's the common good, how do we take our research to speak to our strategic plan, to speak to our mission when we talk about making a difference? So some of our research in big data for the common good is focused on climate change adaptation. Healthcare, that I'm gonna go a little bit more deeper in today. Environmental sciences and understanding invasive species. <coughs> in understanding education, what are the retention uh, challenges in learning and in education that we face? How do we take our methodologies and, and apply them to that domain? So variety and also national security and, uh, and, just, and we work a lot with the Army Research Labs as well. So how do we take our research and truly uh, apply it from the perspective of the common good? So what does that mean for healthcare? Right? What does that mean for healthcare is there is a push now where we are talking about patient empowerment, where empower patients to take a more active role in their health and help the health of their families. That's profound. How do you, how does one empower a patient? What does that mean? And even AHRQ says it's we're moving away from a disease-centered model to a patient-centered model, where it's not about the disease we are trying to solve, 
It's about the patient that has the disease that we are trying to help, that we are trying to assist, that we are trying to aid. Because each one of us is different. So what we did is, we said, okay, if it is about patient empowerment, then let's forget the word patient for a second. It's about individual empowerment. And health and wellness lives in communities, lives in families, lives in individuals, outside of a healthcare facility. What does that mean? Like what is, and if more than 50% or 60% of the factors governing our diseases and our conditions are lifestyle and uh, environmental factors related, then those are factors that I am responsible for, or each, each one of the family and the community is responsible. How do we support it? So we look at it from a socio-ecological model that we have to start with the individual, understand the individual, what the individual is, uh, and, and how do we then build up the lifestyle factors, social and community networks, socio-economic, cultural, and environmental conditions, and only then we can make a change in policy. So it is sort of going a very bottom-up approach where our view is we need to know who this person is and how we make a difference with that person because it's not that the same uh, message, even in wellness works, uh, I, I have a confession to make. I hate broccoli. I do not like broccoli. And if my physician tells me, Nitesh, eat broccoli, I won't eat it. I won't do anything about it. But, so give me some other alternative. I hope my son is not watching because he should eat broccoli. Um, uh, so, but if you, if, so if that's the message which is given to me, I'm not going to act on it. Or if I live my, leave my physician's facility and I'm given an antibiotic, but I don't have refrigeration to store the antibiotic. It's going to be spoiled in 24 hours. The physician feels has empowered the patient with the antibiotic. The, the patient leaves. In 24 hours, the antibiotic is of no use. And the patient is back at the healthcare facility for a more serious condition. So have you truly solved the problem? Because we didn't quite understand what that individual empowerment is. So what we are building, so our vision at Notre Dame is to, and at Notre Dame, we worry about these things because we are Notre Dame. That's what we do. We worry about what are the big challenges that face us from the society, from the global level. And it's just not in the United States. It's just not in our community. It's, it's global, uh, these factors. So right now, we are working with, we are very grateful to our, our community partners to be able to work in all these initiatives with them. We work with both the hospitals in South Bend, uh, Beacon Health System and St. Joe Regional Medical Center. We work with the Health Exchange, Michigan Health Information Network. Which, uh, provides, which helps us navigate the data. We work with the Minority Health Coalition. We work with the United Way Foundation. We work with independent living facilities for seniors. We work with middle schools. And we truly do work with them. And I'll, I'll tell you about the projects that we have underway, and those are the projects you'll see. We work with prenatal coordinators uh, as well. So we really have built a collaborative because if we are through talking about these technologies and these innovations, we publish them well, but we haven't achieved our mission. If we, if we haven't achieved our purpose, rather, our mission and, uh, that how do we make a difference to the community. So we have been very diligently working and successfully working in building these collaborative, and that's what makes South Bend a beautiful place to be. And so what are we trying to build? We are basically trying to see, okay, this is the collective big data that governs our health, family, lifestyle, socioeconomic conditions, and what have you. The rates of diabetes in the state of Indiana Overall, it's say 10%, but if you look at the socioeconomic factors, they vary a lot. What does that mean? So how do we truly address these issues? And bringing in this, so from a technology innovation perspective, from an algorithmic innovation perspective that excites us and gives the students wonderful PhDs uh, and makes them successful in their careers, we are building up a platform that truly brings in all these factors, that truly brings in uh, our information about physicians, so we have uh, pu uh, publications, lots of awards, inventions, patent, and uh, a check in this area. We are worrying about education. We worry about social network. We worry about fitness. We worry about nutrition. Because that's what defines a person as a whole. Right? When we talk about the socio-ecological model, it's just not about I walk into my physician's office, the only thing the physician knows is what disease I have been diagnosed with. And that's why I do not like personally electronic medical record. It should be an electronic person record. Because when I walk into a physician office, it should be about me. And I should be empowered with certain actions that I can take under my circumstance, whatever that circumstance may be. How am I embedded in my social network? So we are building up that data and, and algorithm platform at our end from a from research perspective. So 
that's what it is our big data for the common good. And, and the tough challenge that we are undertaking is how do we take these innovations and our, our contributions to science and engineering and truly make technology meet society? And those are the four pilots that uh, we'll be talking about and creating a personalized um, uh, healthcare experience. So I'll give you a very brief introduction to what we do. We are focusing on, as I said, our socio-ecological model is dynamic. It starts with an individual. And our goal is to engage and empower that individual with the knowledge of data, with the knowledge of algorithms, with the power of uh, computing uh, or technology. So one of the projects that we have we're going to be launching this fall is in collaboration with the United Way uh, in the Foundation and South Bend Career Academy. It's a, it's a public charter school uh, in South Bend. And we are giving, we are taking our back-end algorithms, technology, and developing an app as a front-end for middle and high school kids to work, to play with. Why? Because obesity and adolescence is a significant problem. So can we take our, our, our experiences with leveraging with technology and take it to a middle school level where students, maybe in, students can interact with it. And now because it's a charter school and they have project-based learning as well, we're inviting the students of that school to even contribute to the ideas of the, of the app, uh, of what the technology, how they're going to use it. So we are, uh, and the school coach is involved, the school nurse is involved, the faculty are involved. So we do have, we have sort of built uh, an ecosystem. Why? Because after the individual, it's the community and the family. So we cannot really say we're targeting the individual without creating a support system, especially for an adolescent, especially for childhood obesity. And the other thing we are interested in is looking at the mother and the child dyad as to what that means. Uh, because unfortunately, some of the children in the school are from broken families, so how does they move a lot? So how do we take those factors into account to, be, to make a difference? The other project which we are also excited about, if we, have, uh, we haven't launched it yet, we're developing the technology, we are, uh, the, the front-end technology for it is what we call MomLink. It's in collaboration with both the hospitals, with the prenatal care coordinators, with the Minority Health Coalition, United Way, and from the everyday health with what to expect when you're expecting. So we were able to uh, develop a partnership with them, took some time, so now we have all the digitized data from the book that I know I read when my wife was pregnant. Uh, to, uh, <laughs> what, so I knew what she's expecting, so I could be better prepared. Uh, what to expect when you're expecting, so we have built that partnership. And why? Because the infant mortality rates in Indiana are higher than any, anywhere else, any other state, uh, and St. Joe County as well. And it's just, so how do we, and a lot of these factors are related to behavior. Some of these mothers don't even see a uh, physician in the first trimester. So how do we enable a smooth transition through care, through information, through tracking, through, through providing the knowledge back? Because, and, and so through our partnership at United Way in a 2 one, one campaign, as the, the, the mothers get involved, the prenatal care coordinators will now not only be able to have an electronic, a digital technology-driven mechanism of interacting with the mothers, the mothers will have, expecting mothers will have an interaction available with the prenatal care coordinators. And by us knowing, as I said, it's about the individual, what literacy rate do the mothers have? What socioeconomic conditions they may be? And with, uh, uh, what to expect when you're expecting, we're gonna create slide shares uh, and content tailored to what their individual circumstance may be. So we are sort of building up that ecosystem as well to help, uh, and with the, uh, to help the expecting Mothers, and this is again going to both the hospitals uh, and the prenatal care coordinators and the minority health coalition in, uh, in, in South Bend. Uh, and the other one that we're looking at is we're working on a diabetes. This is a, a project which has been funded by Indiana CTSI, uh, which is an NIH uh, uh, funded big grant and as part of the commun community health engagement program in CTSI. Uh, is we are working with a community clinic on which is jointly shared by both the hospitals, again, Bendix Family Physician and Nishiana Health Information Network. And why we chose that clinic is a lot of the, those again are individuals that the clinic is, uh, is serving are generally underinsured, uninsured, with socioeconomic conditions may not be favorable. So while, yes, we could have said, okay, let's work with the insured population, 
But to me, that's not what we do, because we are not with them. We say, what, are, what difference we want to truly make at the ground level, at the community level. So we are working with uh, community clinics which are serving of largely underserved, uninsured members with socioeconomic conditions not favorable, and seeing how we can take technology to make a difference to them. And so we'll be launching that pilot. And the other one, we just finished a year, and if we were very excited by that, where we are working with, so as you can see, we are working with adolescents, expecting mothers, uh, chronic conditions, and seniors. And the whole idea is, can we truly understand what the front end use cases is of, of our technology, of our data, of our algorithms at the back end? Uh, we are working with seniors uh, for the last nine months at the Heritage Foundation along with uh, a Memorial uh, Beacon uh, Health System. And they, are, they had never used technology before. So we, and this was a game changing experience for me you know, uh, we felt, oh, they're going to love what we are doing. And we walked into it, gave them our tablets, said, use our technology, and within 24 hours, they said, we do not like it. Um, and I said, okay, so could you tell me why you don't like it? And they said, well, are you patient enough? I said, oh, I am. That we have is we are patient. We'll be, we are, if you don't know me well, uh, I'm very persistent. Uh, I don't give up easily. So I said, no, we'll, we'll figure it out for you. Tell us what you need. And then we spent a lot of time revamping our our technology to serve, to, they became our partners in development. And in the end, they gave us feedback. They said, what we loved about this, you didn't do it for us, you do it, did it with us. And that truly changed about how we are going about all these deployments now and, and how we are sort of thinking about these problems. They didn't like us before, they love us now, They're, nobody dropped out of our study, and they convinced Beacon Health System to continue with the study as well. And what they said is now when they go, and we have empowered them, because they take a tablet and they go see the physician and they say, I didn't sleep well last night, you should know. I didn't do this, I, didn't, I missed my medication. Because medication compliance is a big issue for the senior population as well. I, didn't, I missed my medication, I missed this. So now with the technology, all they have to do is show that to their uh, physicians. So those are some of the things that you know, you'll get to see and interact with. So what, and as I said, it's just not a, uh, a uh, from an individual as a, as, as a patient or as a person, it is an ecosystem. So how, in all our research, we worry about how do we engage with the nurses, with the physicians, and the community health workers. Community health workers are a very powerful group, and uh, they are sometimes more believable than even a physician. Speak the same language, perhaps, sometimes, understand the social conditions, and can help translate the complexities of what healthcare is to the patient much more easily. So how can we take all of these, and as I said, it's just not about technology and addressing it for a person and moving away. If you truly want to make a difference, we have to create an ecosystem. And that's what you know, we are committed to building uh, and, and to our partnerships. So, uh, so we have a lot of these uh, things, uh, uh, interfaces developed, because I strongly believe that innovation is just not about technology, it is about people. So how do we get people leverage the technology, use the technology, uh, and, make, and make benefit of the technology? So I'll, I'll pass it on to my colleague Ram here, and she'll talk about some of the work that she is doing in empathy in healthcare. How do physicians take empathy in com communication and conversation? Because that's important from a dialogue and empowerment perspective. Uh, Vanya Smedoka, I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology, and uh, I'm here to just briefly talk to you a little bit about how our knowledge of networks can help us to understand empathy. So I will show you a specific example of how we can contribute to, to healthcare, to understanding doctor-patient relationship, as well as things such as the humanity of care. So we've all, at some point in our life, we've had some issues with healthcare, or at least have had you know, in terms of personal health, or someone we know has had some health care issues. Um, in most of these cases, the doctor communicated with you, um, was listening to what you had to say, could hear what, what it is that you needed, they connected with you in some way. But in some of the other instances you might have experienced, um, the doctor might have only swooped in for a few minutes to, to deal with you for what little time that doctor had, might not have really heard what you had to say or what you needed. Um, or in other cases, might even have dismissive, perhaps even callous or unempathetic to your needs. So that's what I'm um, Oops, sorry. 
get away. Um, so um, um, networks are very powerful tools to, to talk about um, healthcare, as they can teach us a lot about empathy and how, um, uh, how people acquire it, how they maintain it, but also how they might use it. So why is it important to study this? Um, because specifically in contexts where there might be a great disparity between physicians and their patients, there might be issues of poverty, um, or a patient who's um, uneducated in some way, or maybe they're, um, they, they just un do not uh, quite understand exactly what's going on with them, a lack of empathy can, can lead to, to significant issues, can lead to uh, things such as um, miscommunication, um, can lead to misdiagnosis, mistreatment, um, or it could lead to, like people were saying, uh, a patient maybe not taking the medication as they should. So patients, excuse me, patients in these uh, contexts can then be considered to be non-compliant, and non-compliant patients can then become problematic for the larger uh, medical system. So this in turn affects uh, patients' uh, health outcomes, but it also increases healthcare costs, and it can uh, greatly affect public health in, uh, in significant ways. And so our work, uh, as I sense our me in, in anthropology, can help to alleviate this issue by contributing to the common good, to, to understand what is actually going on here and then to, to find some solutions to it. So like Nitesh said, uh, technology is certainly important in, in healthcare, but solutions are about people, not technology. Technology is contextualized through people and their relations. And that's where uh, my own discipline of anthropology can, can come in and become relevant because anthropology is about people. Uh, we explain why people do certain things, how they do them, and how they actually understand uh, the world around them. So let's define empathy for a second. Um, so it's an ability to cognitively or emotionally understand another's perspective. We use it colloquially to talk about you know, uh, walking in someone else's shoes, uh, feeling a connection, um, a, taking a different perspective, being non-judgmental, or understanding, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're losing a bit of power here, uh, <laughs> um, or understanding where other people are coming from, and then being able to communicate that in, in, in certain ways. Um, so what's interesting is that for decades, scholars have been studying uh, why, and, uh, and have actually been puzzled by why physicians seem to lose empathy as they move through medical school. Um, so it has been suggested that it's actually the, the formal curriculum, there's something taking place uh, within the formal curriculum of medical school um, that, that is having an effect on this. Perhaps the, the long hours contributing to, to burnout, the very long rotations, um, or um, uh, various sorts of, of pressures that can contribute to this loss. But, is, but what's um, perhaps even more pu puzzling is that the most marked loss actually takes place um, at the beginning of the third year of medical school, where physicians begin to interact with patients. So basically when they begin to do what they're training to do, which is care for patients, that's when uh, uh, their empathy seems to suffer. Not every single physician and not every medical student, but overall there is a decrease in empathy. So why is that? Um, so what we're investigating is the, the hidden curriculum, um, which uh, the, the hidden curriculum is uh, are those learning moments outside of the formal classroom, the conversations in the hallway, or the you know the, the older mentor who comes in and says, look, let me show you how we're doing this surgery. But it's outside of the of the formal classrooms, and that's where medical students are actually acquiring the majority of their ideas, their attitudes, or their beliefs about medical care. So um, uh, the, the, the hidden curriculum is a, is a, is a toolkit. Uh, they're you know, uh, creating this toolkit of, of, of abilities, and it's primarily shaped by authority figures. So the, the hidden curriculum is a black box, and social networks can help us to, to look at it. So that's where my project comes in. Um, uh, we're, we're studying this in an innovative, um, interesting way, um, where we're combining uh, network science, computer modeling, as well as the methods of cultural anthropology, which is talking with real people in, the, in their real life. 
Um, and we explore the, the role played by social networks, by social capital, by um, especially within high stress medical environments. And um, we, we've partnered with, uh, with the Catholic Medical School and Hospital in the city of Puebla in Mexico. Notre Dame have a program abroad in Puebla, and that has become a good uh, focus of, of our research. And our team is multidisciplinary. We have people from anthropology, from computer science, from sociology, and, and from medicine. And uh, we've also involved undergraduate students at all levels of this, of this uh, project, including uh, uh, Bernadette, who, you know, you can wave to everyone. Uh, Bernadette uh, was just in, in, in Mexico with me um, this past summer. She was a freshman at the time, and, uh, and she, she went and she helped to collect uh, network data, ethnographic data, among medical students and physicians um, to, 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 to contribute to this, uh, to this, uh, to this endeavor. So our goal is to, is to track the, the flow of knowledge, of advice, of techniques and attitudes within these networks, especially flowing from mentors to students, particularly looking at how this takes place in high-stress um, high contexts, for instance, uh, an emergency ward or an obstetrics ward, where, where there's certainly a lot going on, and how, do these, uh, how, how does this knowledge, how do these attitudes get, get transferred in this? in these moments of hidden curriculum. So to do this, we're tracking the, uh, the, the strength of the relationship uh, between dyads, which is two people, or triads, which is three people. So you can see if you a student mentor, or student mentor mentor, it could be student peer relationships, or even the roles of these units, and how these affect the way that uh, the, the people learn about health or, or patient care. So our data so far does show that that there is uh, a definite increase in empathy over time, which is affected by the different networks that, uh, that the medical students belong to, whether these are peer networks or mentorship networks, advice networks, etc. So why is all this important? Um, we can, um, not only can we contribute to, to understanding how doctors professionalize, how they become the people that care for us or others in, in, in moments of health crises, um, but also we can contribute to, to understanding and improving the doctor-patient interactions by understanding uh, and identifying where some of these issues lie. And in, in turn, then we can transform medical education, um, so feed this back into excuse me, the, uh, the ways that people are actually learning about, about uh, patient care. And so thus we can contribute to improving people's health and, as Nitesh has certainly mentioned, empowering patients in turn to be able to uh, you know, so they can uh, contribute to their own uh, to their own health. Um, additionally, I wanted to think about uh, some of the other interesting applications that this can have beyond healthcare. So you see, we have to talk about health, but I'm also pushing it to think beyond that, which is uh, thinking about how uh, uh, you know how we can identify some of these different uh, hidden factors of mentorship in other professions, such as the legal profession or the corporate world. Um, to identify how young professionals learn the culture of a place that they're entering into and what effect um, some of these informal contexts has on this development. For instance, the protege relationship that can develop within the, the corporate or the, or the legal world. Um, and though we're specifically looking at empathy, we can easily shift our attention to looking at some of the factors that could be interesting within contexts outside of healthcare, such as you know, how do you measure performance? How are people learning about about uh, perseverance, about innovation, about, about risk taking, etc. And how these sort of attitudes and beliefs and knowledge is being uh, transferred from mentors or peers to, to certain individuals. So um, any of these can be studied at this very interesting interface between anthropology and network science by looking specifically at, at these sort of small networks that are taking place. So I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Rania. So, as, as hopefully the, the, the core message that we wanted to give away, the takeaway message from us was to truly make a health and wellness difference, uh, we have to look at it from a socio-ecological model which, does us, which just doesn't stop at, uh, for us at our publications and our inventions and our uh, innovations. We are thinking about it via our partnerships and how we translate our research to make a difference to the community. 
how do we learn about communication and empathy, whether it's from a nursing, community health, community health worker, or a physician perspective. Because then collectively, we have built an ecosystem. We have built a socio-ecological model which is dynamic. And I'd like to introduce you to some of our friends here. These were our first uh, group of seniors who, were, who started using our technology, and, and that's my PhD student, Deepa, who now is a, a, a fellow spending a year at the Trinity Health System. Uh, so she was uh, the inaugural fellow in analytics at the Trinity Health System, and she's working with the physicians and, uh, in, in, in Livonia, so that's why she couldn't be here today. Uh, and they're truly, it's been, it's been wonderful. It's been truly a, a very, uh, it's been a great experience. And in building all of these things, in building this aspect for the common good, I'm looking forward for one side effect, only one side effect. The tomorrow, <laughs> my, oh, sorry. Tomorrow, my two kids, Naisha and Ahan, will be much better prepared for taking care of their health and wellness. If I can get that side effect and leave a society, which is where the healthcare system is robust, where individuals are empowered, where we truly solve the patient empowerment, then we have achieved, then I have achieved my goal. And then we as a university have achieved a strategic plan as well from that perspective and how we truly understand the mind, the heart, the human condition and the universe surrounding us. Because that's what a socio-ecological model is. Thank you and I welcome you all to, to truly meet with our rock stars and, and interact with them uh, and see where it goes. And we also have a raffle, by the way, and Jasmine will be picking up. We are giving Fitbit devices to five of the people who have come here today. So, uh, and we'll be tracking you. <laughs> so take your 10,000 steps and your sleep. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and go Irish. Let's win tomorrow too. Yeah. And we'll take any questions or we can interact. So, uh, any questions that you may have now or any questions that you may have uh, later and we'll be available.